drives me as a filmmaker is the need to, um, the desire to tell stories that haven't been told or have been, um, you know, incorrectly told mm. and um, to reconnect, reframe uh, the narrative. Um, so a lot of my work is about uncovering stories that have been, you know, um, haven't, you know, haven't been told or haven't been told in, in the way that, um, you know, that I believe needs to be told. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Woodstock Film Festival Let's Talk Film podcast. I'm your host, Adam Chartoff. Uh, the Woodstock Film Festival is a haven for networking with high caliber industry members, voting members of the Academy, filmmakers, musicians, and fiercely independent artists. And we have with us today a very charming and talented filmmaker <laughs> and friend of the festival, Yoruba Richin. Uh, you're on the advisory board, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's correct. Very, okay. And actually, I'll get to your intro in a moment, but you are in the Hudson Valley as we speak. I am. I'm very happy. So yes, uh, I am. I'm in Hudson Valley as we speak. Um, You're in the foothills of the Catskills, right? Where you are. We don't have to say where, but you are. Oh, yeah, in the Catskills. Yep, near Woodstock. Yoruba Richin is an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose work has been featured on multiple outlets, including Netflix, MSNBC, FX, Hulu, HBO, and PBS. You're the founding director of... Hold the on. documentary the program. Documentary program at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism. Graduate School CUNY. of Journalism. Yeah. Graduate School, excuse me, thank you. Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. The most recent film, The Rebellious Life of Rose, Mrs. Rosa Parks, premiered at Tribeca Film Festival and won a Peabody Award. Or do we say Peabody? Peabody. I think so. It's currently streaming on Peacock. I felt that I had a miss, but people did not choose to listen to what I was saying. We all understand that she sat down on the bus. The policeman, he said, why don't you stand up? I said, I don't think I should have to stand up. The narrow narrative of her just on one day did something. Couldn't be further from the truth. Often, the man is out front, and you never hear about the wife. Here, the reverse is true. She was considered a threat. Espousing radical views. If they could see her talking about the Republic of New Africa, her out there with the Panthers, then they would understand the real Rosa Parks, but they might have been just a little frightened. She has been an activist for over three decades. For Ms. Parks, it was especially dangerous. Fighting on issues that are still very much at the forefront. She never gave up. She lit the torch to the next generation. Other recent works includes Emmy-nominated films, American Reckoning, which is on PBS Frontline, How It Feels to Be Free on American Masters, The Sit-In, Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, which is on Peacock, and Green Book, Guide to Freedom on the Smithsonian Channel. You are one of these really industrious and um, prolific filmmakers. Can I ask you what drives you? I think what drives me is, well, a lot of things. What drives me as a filmmaker is the need to, um, the desire to tell stories that haven't been told or have been, um, you know, incorrectly told mm. and um, to reconnect, reframe uh, the narrative. Um, so a lot of my work is about uncovering stories that have been, you know, um, haven't, you know, haven't been told or haven't been told in, in the way that, um, you know, that I believe needs to be told. Um, so that's a big driving factor. And so, you know, there's a lot of those stories out there. <laughs> um, and then also too, our political state in this country has been, uh, there are, times when things feel better and, and, and um, uh, less polarized. But quite frankly, I feel like for my entire life, you know, we've been in this political uh, struggle um, for, for more rights and, and more, uh, you know, more equality. And so that drives me. 
to the, my films to be a part of that, you know, of that struggle and to illuminate and elucidate those stories um, and those people that are are fighting fighting for that. Um, so you know, I kind of jokingly say, uh, but it's you know kind of true that anger motivates me as well. Um, anger at where where we are politically and you know what we have to continue to try to fight for uh, in this country. Well, well, you mentioned a few moments ago, you look for stories or you're driven to tell stories about that are have been mistold or um, incompletely told in the past. And here, one great example is your new documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And there's a story where I grew up, for instance, um, as many of people did, thinking this woman is known because she refused to stand, uh, move from the front of the bus when told to move to the back. And that's the entire context of how I grew up. Now, I did find out before I saw your documentary, I, I did find out more that she had been a civil rights worker many years of being uh, a civil rights worker. But I think there's a great example of exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, um, I too, you know, for the most part, uh, for most of my life, thought that that was the extent of her activism. And, um, you know, I only learned recently, uh, you know, before I made the film, that she was a investigator of uh, sexual crimes against black women in the South in the 1940s. Um, that I learned recently, and that really piqued my interest to understand more about this woman who we have sort of reduced, um, you know, reduced to, to the bus. Uh, so when the film, my co-director, Joanna Hamilton, approached me about working with her on this film, uh, based on the book by the same title uh, by Jean Theo Harris, who's also at CUNY at Brooklyn College. Um, okay. You know, I was immediately intrigued and I read the book and I read, you know, for the first time really understood the breadth of her work and her activism and the sacrifices that she made in order to do this work. So yes, her story is a prime example of, you know, of the mistelling of the people in the Black freedom struggle and who, you know, are part of it. Can you, um, oh, well, I recommend people check it, this out. It's on Peacock, uh, which uh, is a streaming app, of course. And um, it's a, a, a wonderful story um, and a powerful story. Thank you. Yeah. Talk to me how you uh, found your way to the Woodstock Film Festival and your history with the festival, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Um, so I think I started coming up here to the um, to the Hudson Valley area. I'm a, I'm a native New Yorker, born and bred, um, but I didn't, I don't think I, I think I started coming up here maybe in the early 2000s um, for the first time, which is kind of strange. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Harlem. It's actually not that far. <laughs> um, but, yeah, really easy, you know, easy bus ride or, car ride. But yeah, so I think that's when I first started coming up here. Um, so I don't think I came up here. Well, actually, no. Okay, no, I take that back. I went to camp in Kingston what? in seventh and eighth grade. Great read. Yes. Um, was this a, uh, I, well, given that it's a hundred miles away, I have to imagine it was a sleepaway camp. Yeah, it was a sleepaway camp. Yep. I went in seventh grade, the summer between seventh and eighth grade. Okay. So that's the first memory I have. And, you know, things, Kingston was very different then. <laughs> um, but uh, that, so that was in the 80s. And then I started coming here, you know, on the weekends, like just to check it out, just to have, you know, stay in like a, actually it was before Airbnb, just like a bed and breakfast and check out the area and, and all that. Yeah. So that was like in the like early 2000s, mid 2000s. And, you know, always loved it. It was beautiful. Was amazed that it was so close. Um and then I went to the Woodstock Film Festival for the first time around that time, maybe like the mid 2000s, around 2007, 2008, something like that, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, I knew some people who were, uh, you know, involved. Uh, and so that was my first exposure to the, to the festival. And then I, you know, probably came back a few times. And then I was, you know, lucky enough 
uh, fortunate enough to be able to um, get a place up here. And that was a couple years ago. And that's when, um, you know, that Mira, the, who runs the festival, asked me to be on the advisory bo board, and I happily agreed. Have you had an opportunity to show any of your films there? So I haven't. They've done, um, the festival has presented my films, because, um, right. you know, they do year-round programming. Yes. It was during the pandemic, so it was when everything was outdoors, but we did show the Harry Belafonte film. It was essentially part of the festival. That counts, by the way. Yes, exactly. It doesn't matter if it's in the festival or if it's provide, uh, presented by the festival. You are part of the uh, the fabric of the Woodstock Film Festival either way. Uh, and let's talk a little bit just about festivals and your, your relation to the festivals in general and, you know, like just how vital festivals are for so many film, filmmakers. What has been your experience? Yeah. If we just talk a few minutes about um, that. Yeah, I mean, for me, I feel like my first or my second film, The New Black, we really did a uh, that was, you know, the, that was the last time I had like a full year run festival run, which was amazing. And, you know, and then a broad, you know, and then a, a broadcast and was really able to do, you know, a, a, a year of festivals, which is ideal. Like that is really what we as filmmakers want. Um, because it is so, there's nothing like having your fest, your film uh, in, watching your film in a room full of people, taking, you know, questions, interacting, um, you know, interacting with the local community. It's, it's amazing and it, nothing feels like it. Um, you know, I think the pandemic obviously shifted things a bit, right? So a lot of festivals were online. You know, that, that was the year we were supposed to premiere um, my my Harry Belafonte film at Tribeca, and that was canceled, of course, um, in 2020. And then with Rose, my Rosa Parks film, we were able to uh, we did premiere at Tribeca, and we're able to do a few more a bunch of other festivals. But we did have the broadcast; it started streaming in October. So you know that also kind of limits. Uh, how your festival run to when you after you broadcast, but we we are we're actually still being asked to show the film in festivals. So that's wonderful, and you know festivals and screenings, um, screenings that people you know that um, uh, screenings by organizations, but it, you, at uh, educational institutions um, and festivals, they're just such a vital part of what we, um, you know, of our process as filmmakers and of, and of how we get our films out there. Not to put you on the spot, but what does it mean to be on the advisory board of the Woodstock Film Festival? Well, um, Mira, you know, again, I'm pretty new, but um, Mira, you know, will consult uh, with us, ask for, you know, recommendations for people for panelists, for panels, uh, the kind of panels, you know, other events and, you know, sort of pick our brain about what we'd like to see uh, at the festival. Right, got it. So it's really, I could see why it would be important to then have a pretty diverse, uh, you know, group of people on the advisory board. So you get a, a different um, ideas and opinions and experiences, right? It makes sense. Absolutely. And people with different expertise. There might be some people who are, you know, filmmakers or producers, others who are just producers, others who are in the distribution world, right. uh, in the, you know, um, the different kinds of filmmakers. So absolutely. What uh, is the uh, strikes, have the strikes affected your work? You know, we think of the screenwriter strike. You're not, a, uh, we don't think of documentary filmmakers as screenwriters. I'm, I'm being devil's advocate, and you're yeah. not, you're not, uh, there are no actors in a documentary. You make nonfiction films. Yeah, well, I actually am in the Writers Guild because uh, we sometimes do, uh, are able to take a credit for, for writing, which I actually believe in and think is really important, especially, you know, in the way that I, um, you know, the way that I work really starts with the, the, text of what people are saying and putting that together. <laughs> so that is writing, uh, essentially. You know, it's the it's not just the 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 strikes. I think the whole industry is experiencing a um, 
you know, uh, reverberations from the pandemic, the end of the pandemic, the need or desire for so much content that happened during the pandemic. And now that that's end, and, and now that it's, you know, ended essentially, or at least the heat of it, you know, what that means for the industry. And then, you know, there's the fight, we're seeing this, the same fight, uh, struggle that, that uh, creatives are having with corporations. Um, you know, these places like the streamers and the uh, cable broadcasters um, are corporations who uh, are beholden, I guess, I don't even, you know, to their share, their shareholders. And they have algorithms of how they make money. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily benefit uh, the creators or most of the creators, maybe some of the creators. So I think the whole industry um, of television and film, which includes documentary, is roiling right now. And, you know, we will see, we will see what happens. Um, I'm working, the films that I'm working on right now, currently right now, are with PBS. And PBS is how I got started, um, mm -hmm. is, you know, I owe my career to PBS, who saw something in me as a filmmaker, quite frankly, even before I believed in myself and was just, you know, taking a chance and a risk like this is what I want to do. And they believed in my vision and supported my vision. And that's how I became a filmmaker. Um, so, you know, working with PBS again and, you know, consistently throughout my career um, is, you know, is, is extremely valuable. And at a time like this, you know, PBS uh, different, you know, unlike other um, broadcasters, uh, cable and, and streamers, they're, you know, continuing their mission of serving the public and of supporting filmmakers and of supporting diverse filmmakers. Um, and that's never wavered. So I, I think it's important to acknowledge that. I don't suppose you can talk about what you're working on, or is that something you Oh, absolutely. Have? No, no, for sure. Um, I have a film that is uh, going to be on America Reframe, the PBS program America Reframe, about reparations um, and looking at uh, stories of reparations that are happening right now between descendants of enslavers and descendants of enslaved, um, of the enslaved, while also telling kind of the history of the, the reparations movement, which has really um, been, you know, a history since the begin end of slavery until today. And it's really only the last couple of years that it's been something that um, has seen, you know, at least uh, attainable, possibly attainable, uh, but certainly talked about in a, way, in a legitimate way, um, even though African-Americans have been, you know, pushing for reparations since, uh, you know, since we were freed as slaves. Um, so that's one film. And then uh, another film that I am working on in production, I'm co-directing with my um, co-director, Brad Lichtenstein. We directed the film American Reckoning, which was recently nominated for an Emmy, as you just mentioned. And it's about the Wilmington massacre, insurrection and massacre of 1898, which is considered the most successful uh, insurrection um, successful, quote unquote, insurrection uh, in American history uh, and was um, a, a story that was very well known at the time and then buried. Um, so those are the two two pieces I'm working on. I don't think you can answer this because you can't let the cat out of the bag. Probably. <laughs> Is there a uh, like the story like that you would love to be able to tell, you know, if you just had all the resources you needed, is there that special story that you've yet to tell? Yeah, I mean, there's there's tons. Um, <laughs> you're gonna get to a lot of them, I think, because you're still yeah. really young, so. Yeah, uh, you know, I love music documentaries and I love uh, telling the story of, um, you know, of, uh, of our great musicians, which has so shaped, you know, American, oh, not just American, you know, worldwide culture. Um, so there's a lot of music documentaries that I would love to make for sure. All right. Well, you have to show it at the Woodstock Film Festival. Yes, it? absolutely. It would make sense. <laughs> they are known for their music docs. You know? That's, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Yoruba, for spending some time today. Uh, absolutely. Yoruba, tell people how they can follow you and keep up with you and your work. Absolutely. Yes, you can uh, follow my Facebook page, which is just my name, 
uh, Yoruba Richen, Y-O-R-U-B-A, Richen, R-I-C-H-E-N. And then you can also uh, follow me on Instagram, at Red Rubes. Thanks again, Yoruba. That's it for this episode of the Woodstock Film Festival Let's Talk Film podcast. Don't forget to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the like button and follow us on Instagram as well and on Twitter or X at, at Woodstock Film Festival. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.